Hi everyone! In the last couple of lessons we talked about surfaces and how to do calculus on them. Today we will talk about how to measure their curvature. For a surface sigma and a point P in sigma, there are two unit vectors perpendicular to sigma at P. If sigma has two sides, then we could construct a continuous map N that assigns to each point P in sigma a unit vector perpendicular to sigma at P. Of course, we would not be able to do that on the Moebius band. Having a map N with the desired property is the same as choosing a favorite side on our surface, and the Moebius band has only one side. This motivates the following definition. We say that a surface sigma is orientable if there is a continuous map N from sigma to the sphere with the property that N of P is perpendicular to the tangent plane TP sigma for all P in sigma. A map like this is called an orientation. The first thing we check today is that an orientation is smooth. Remember that to verify smoothness, we have to take a parametrization phi and check that n composed with phi is smooth. This turns out to be very easy because of how we define the tangent plane. Remember the tangent plane is spanned by the partial derivatives of the parametrization, so to obtain the unit vector perpendicular to the tangent plane, we only need to take the cross product and normalize. Also remember that from the definition of parametrization, these two partial derivatives are linearly independent, so this cross product is not zero and we are not dividing over zero here. Then n is either given by this formula or minus this formula. In either case, it depends smoothly on u and v, which is exactly what we wanted to show. When we have a surface with an orientation, we call it an oriented surface, and very often we will call the orientation the Gauss map. Let's see how we can use it to measure curvature. If a surface sigma is a plane, then the Gauss map is constant, so we can think of the derivatives of the Gauss map to be a quantitative way of measuring how much a surface is not a plane. If we have a surface sigma and a point P in sigma, the derivative of the Gauss map at P is a linear function from the tangent plane to sigma at P to the tangent plane to S2 at N of P. And you may have noticed that these two planes have something in common. They are actually the same plane. Why? Let's just look at the sphere S2 and take a point Q. The tangent plane to S2 at Q consists precisely of the vectors perpendicular to Q. So if Q is N of P, this plane coincides with TP sigma the vectors perpendicular to n of p. The linear map that goes from tp sigma to itself, that assigns to each vector v minus the derivative of n in the direction of v, is called the shape operator, and we denote it by s. Now we have to do some algebra and some geometry. Let's do the algebra first. We are going to show that this linear map, the shape operator, is self-adjoint. Recall that a self-adjoint linear map is one that we can pass from one side to the other in a dot product. To show that S is self-adjoint, take a parametrization phi around P. Since we are going to take a lot of derivatives, let's write phi u and phi v instead of the partial derivatives of phi with respect to u and v, and n u and v instead of the partial derivatives of n with respect to u and v. We begin by looking at the dot product between S of phi u and phi v. This by definition equals minus nu times phi v. Since the Leibniz rule applies to dot products, this can be rewritten as minus the derivative with respect to u of the dot product between n and phi v plus the dot product between n and phi u v, the second partial derivative of phi with respect to u and v. The first term here is zero, right? n is perpendicular to the tangent plane, and phi v belongs to the tangent plane, so their dot product is zero. We are left with this expression, to which we can apply the Leibniz rule again to get the derivative with respect to v of the dot product between n and phi u minus the dot product between n v and phi u. The first expression is zero again, because phi u belongs to the tangent plane and n is perpendicular to the tangent plane. The remaining expression is precisely s of phi v times phi u. We haven't shown that s is self-adjoint yet, but we have shown that when we have phi u and phi v, 
we can put S on either side and get the same result. Now if we have two vectors B and W in TP sigma, we can write them as linear combination of pi U and pi B, because, well, that's a basis. Then, when we take the dot product between S of V times W, we can expand this expression and pass S to the other side. And this shows that S is self-adjoint. Why do we care so much about this? Well, recall the spectral theorem. It says that if we have a vector space X with a dot product and S a self-adjoint linear map from this vector space to itself, then S is diagonalizable, and moreover, we can find an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Applying this theorem to the shape operator, we see that there are two orthonormal vectors, E1 and E2, in TP sigma, for which S of E1 is K1 E1 and S of E2 is K2 E2, for some numbers K1 and K2. We will always label them in such a way that K2 is less or equal than K1. These two numbers are called the principal curvatures of sigma at P, and the directions of the vectors E1 and E2 are called the principal directions. Let's see what is the geometric meaning of these numbers. Take a curve gamma parametrized by arc length, passing through P and having velocity V at time zero. When we compute s of v dot v, this is minus the derivative of n in the direction of v dot v. This is minus the derivative of n with respect to time dot gamma prime. We can again use the Leibniz rule to rewrite this as minus the derivative of n times the velocity of gamma plus the dot product between n and the acceleration of gamma. Of course, the first term vanishes because n is perpendicular to the surface and gamma prime is tangent to the surface, and we end up with this dot product. This dot product is a quantitative measure of how much is the curve gamma bending in the direction of n. For example, if we have this surface and take n pointing upwards, the quantity s of v times v is always positive because all the curves in the surface passing through p bend in the direction of n. On the other hand, if we have this surface, all the curves in sigma passing through p bend in the direction opposite to n. Now we have this other surface, some curves in sigma bend in the direction of n, and some others bend in the opposite direction. This is the geometric meaning of the quantity s of v times v. Now back to algebra. We can write a unit vector v as cos theta e1 plus sine theta e2, where theta is the angle from e1 to v. Then s of v times v is s of cos theta e1 plus sine of theta e2 times v. Since e1 and e2 are eigenvectors, this is k1 cos theta e1 plus k2 sine theta e2 dot cos theta e1 plus sine theta e2. Remember that E1, E2 form an orthonormal basis, so their dot product is zero and their length is one. This means that this expression is K1 cos squared of theta plus K2 sine squared of theta. This is less or equal to K1 and greater or equal to K2. On the left, we have equality only if sine of theta is zero, meaning that V is plus minus E1, and on the right, we have equality only if cos theta is zero, meaning that V is plus minus E2. From here, we can extract the geometric meaning of the directions E1 and E2. E1 is the direction in which the curve bends the most towards N, and E2 is the direction in which the curve bends the least towards N. For example, if we have a cylinder like this, E1 will be the pipe direction that bends upwards, and E2 will be the flat direction. If we have this other surface, E1 is this direction in which sigma bends upward, and E2, the orthogonal complement, is this one in which sigma bends downward. Another important quantity that we can extract from a linear map is its determinant. The Gauss curvature K is defined to be the determinant of the shape operator. This determinant also equals the determinant of the derivative of n, and remember that the determinant of a linear function is also the product of the eigenvalues, so k equals k1 times k2. 
In this example, the surface bends towards N in all directions, so K1 and K2 are positive, meaning that the Gauss curvature is positive. In this other example, the surface bends in the direction opposite to N in all directions, so K1 and K2 are both negative, meaning that again, the Gauss curvature is positive. On the other hand, if we have this other surface, it has directions in which the surface bends upwards and some directions in which the surface bends downwards. This means that K1 is positive, K2 is negative, and the Gauss curvature is negative. I'll leave to you to check that if we have a torus like in the picture, it has positive Gauss curvature on the outside and negative Gauss curvature on the inside. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed and see you next time.